We've been looking at Galatians, so we're going to continue to look at Galatians, and we'll continue to try and get takeaways from Paul's letter to this church. Many of the takeaways from the Bible and Paul's letters are as applicable to us in the 21st century as they were then. And I said last week that Paul uh, is speaking to them. It matters what you believe, in other words. Paul doesn't do what we've done, certainly in the Western church. We've diluted Christianity. We've taken out anything that might be remotely offensive to anyone. And we've altered the DNA of what Orthodox Christianity is. And you can't do that, and Paul doesn't do that. He's never interested in numbers. You notice he, he isn't asking the various churches for, you know, as an apostle, can you, can you send me the figures? I'd like to know how many people you've got going to your church, and can we run them through sort of equality, diversity, and inclusivity? Give me a, a balance of ethnic races and age groups and so on. And so he doesn't do any of this. Paul's concerned primarily with the orthodox gospel that was given to him by revelation. Paul knows that he's called by God. And he knows that everything he does and everything he's doing is, is, is to and for him, for Christ. And he sets us this example that we're to follow. And when you read Paul, you're not reading a man who's caught up in status quo, lukewarm Christianity. So often in the West, that's where we veer to. We, we want everyone to somehow be in unity. But Paul isn't bothered about that in the sense that, of course, there's unity in the early church. But he wants them to believe what has been given to him by revelation from God. Yahweh in terms of the Old Testament, Father in Heaven, Jesus. So Paul is one of the later. There'll never be another apostle like Paul. Paul was given this. So let's read. It says in uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, After 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I also took Titus along. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as, e as leaders, you know, presumably Peter, John, the other apostles. And I, uh, when you read this, everywhere in the New Testament, everywhere in Acts, the Spirit of God is leading. People don't just get a plan together. Let's have some blue sky thinking. Let's just use our intelligence, our mind and our brain. No, they're reliant on the Spirit. They're reliant on God's leading. And the Spirit says, you know, here, I went in response to a revelation. Now, I think, and you can read for hours on this, really, but 14 years after he got saved, which is what I'll base, base it on here. So 14 years later, he's going to Jerusalem with Barnabas and Titus. Barnabas, of course, is son of encouragement. Titus, who's not circumcised, he's uh, Greek. And they're going in response to Revelation. Now, when you read Acts of the Apostles, as we went through it, you know, there's Philip's daughters, these four prophetic daughters who prophesy. There's Agabus, the prophet. There's um, words like it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. There's the Apostle Paul. He wants to go to Bithynia, which is Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. But the Spirit bars him from going. He says, no, you're not to go. Now, in our rational mind, we'd say, why is that? But you don't argue with God. Then he gets a vision of a man from Macedonia, which is Europe. And Paul heads to Europe. And Western civilization is grateful that the Apostle Paul went into Europe. All of our foundational laws, all of our foundational values, as we're finding out, come back from Jesus and the Apostle Paul. Other civilizations are not so fortunate because we've built them on these things. And so we should, you know, this, this response again to Revelation. God knew, God knows what he's doing in every sense of the word. And so the Apostle Paul is, uh, uh, knows Christ, he knows the gospel. No one's ever told him. There'll never be another apostle like that. A man who can write scripture for us and is put in the canon. A, a man that is utterly chosen by God. 
And those of us that, that know the New Testament know that there are, there are these two things. On the one hand, there's the sovereignty of God in choosing, and we'll see in a minute. On the other hand, there's the, uh, the God who wants all and everyone to be saved. The God that, um, whose invitation is to everyone. So he says, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. We're living 2,000 years later. We're living in what has been termed in the past Christian civilization or the Christian West. And to an extent, there are, there are some truths to Christian civilization because we, we have built our civilization on the laws of the Bible. Um, and pretty much it's worked. I'm reading a, a Professor Meyer at the moment, and his PhD at Oxford, I think, was what was part of it was on um, the history of science, history of things like that, innovation. So he's gone back and looked at Boyle or Isaac Newton or Copernicus or Galileo. He's looked at these incredible scientists and he asked this question, why then? Why then? The uh, pharaohs and the Egyptian civilization, they had plenty of free time for science. So did the Greeks. They had plenty of free time. So did the Romans. Why didn't science evolve in any of those civilizations? Why was it Christian civilization that it began to grow so tremendously? All this innovation, all this technology, all of this understanding, observing the universe we live in. And do you know why? Why he puts it and, and, and reading this? And I've never read Isaac Newton's uh, Mathematica, but they all believed in God. They all observed the universe because they wanted to try to comprehend and understand how God had done what he'd done. There's no differentiation, you see, between science and God. That's come later. That's come probably post-Darwin. But it wasn't true then. And so, so many of the technological advancements that human beings have gained in the last several hundred years because of Christian civilization, if I can use that word. Isn't it amazing that when you follow God, when you're interested in, in, in Jesus, that you would want to know? You see, the Greeks didn't care. The Greeks just thought, well, there's the moon. It's bound to go around the earth in a circular. We're, we're bound to be the center or whatever it was. But Copernicus and Galileo began to observe and look and see. Incredible. And I'm grateful to, I can't remember his first name, but... Uh, there's Professor Meyer, who's, who's really a, a great author and knows a hu humongous amount, and I've condensed it to next to nothing compared to uh, what he's actually saying. So, you know, these, these things, and of course I'd probably say because the Apostle Paul went west. The Apostle Paul came this way. There's a lot about you know, the last few hundred years. And I, I know that, our, that, that, that these things are being knocked and there's lots of bad things, but I'm just telling you there's lots of good things too. There's lots of amazing things that happen when people believe in God and say, God, how did you do it? I'm observing. How does it really work? Because the pharaohs, the Greeks, Aristotle, Plato, they could have done, but they weren't interested. They thought they'd figured it out already. So they, they didn't do um, what all of these other people um, had done. So that is, and, and to come back here is to say this, but at this point, probably let's say for the first seven, eight, nine years, we see Pentecost in Acts, don't we? Right up until Cornelius, who's really in Acts 10, the first Gentile, the first Gentile converts. And if you remember Peter from Acts chapter 10, when um, I think he was in Dorcas's house, and he doesn't want to go. So he's a Gentile. 
I'm not going to preach to him. I mean, that's how Peter felt. Do you understand that the, as, as a kind of an Orthodox Jew and he's met Christ and, and knows Jesus? And remember, Jesus too only went to the lost sheep of Israel. And so Peter's probably thinking, well, yes, I know Jesus said go out into all the world to make disciples of all nations, but it's not really on Peter's top agenda. We know from the Gospels that, that it was very hard if you weren't part of, the, uh, part of Israel. The Syrophoenician woman, she got a healing for her son, but it was tough. Jesus came to the lost sheep of Israel. Peter didn't want to go to Cornelius' house. He had to have an open vision telling him, get up, Peter, go, kill and eat, you see. So you can imagine, can't you, that you've now got thousands and thousands and thousands of believers. We know that Peter and John would go to the temple to pray at the, at the specific hours, just as they, because they're Jews. Things didn't change overnight. We look at Christianity today, and, and, and certainly the, the view of, of sort of secular commentators is that we're sort of a white man's religion. But there's, there's more Christians in Africa now. It, it, it's, everything's changing. Because it's, it's for everyone. Um, they've been proven wrong. Christianity is essentially declining, if, if not to the secular commentators at least, looks like it's dying in the West. No one has any answers, but of course, God's going to do something about that at some point. God always has the final say. So now you've got thousands and thousands of Jews who have been brought up with the laws of Moses. They've been brought up with the Pentateuch, you know, the first five books of the Bible. They know it. They're, 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 they've now met Christ. So how would you feel if Johnny-come-lately Gentiles, smelling from the drink that they've done, or whatever it is, who have very little knowledge, if any. They probably have some knowledge of Moses and the law. And so the Jews that are coming in are now saying, you must go through the law of Moses to be a Christian. You have to go through these laws. In other words, then, you must be circumcised. Now, we're so far distant from Israel at that point that it really is never an issue in the Western church. But it was an issue for the early church. Our issues are slightly different where legalism is concerned. But for Paul, um, Paul, this was a big issue. And he doesn't dial it down. He doesn't understand it in the way that I've just explained it to you, you see. Paul is adamant and opposes everything. He calls them false believers have infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ and to make us slaves. He'd say that because anyone under the law of Moses, it makes you a slave. Let me read to you something from um, Romans um, on this, if I can find it. This is Romans 9, verse 30. What shall we say then, that the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith? But the people of Israel who pursued the law as a way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Jesus is the stumbling stone. Jesus is the stumbling stone. And so if you're an Orthodox Jew, and you've met Christ, and you're looking at people coming in, they no longer have to embrace either the Mosaic law or your culture even to be Christians. That's the gospel. It can be obtained by faith. Some of the, the best times, and I, it's why I'm a believer in revival and want revival. Because revival comes and people's hearts are instantly changed by Christ. Lots of, lots of people. Um, and I have to pinch myself every time I see that um, because it's the invisible God made real. Someone has received Christ and their life is completely changed. And this God who is invisible is now visible through this person. 
or if it's a healing or an instant healing or whatever it might be. And that, that you see is coming to Christ. You don't put barriers in the way. Now, the law doesn't work, which was shocking for the Jews of the day and shocking to any Orthodox Jew today. Orthodox Jews today are exactly the same. We're, you know, we're unclean. They don't want to sit next to you on an aeroplane or something, do they? We're, we're not quite right. Jesus comes eating and drinking with sinners. You see, so what Paul's saying, they didn't pursue righteousness by faith, but they pursued the law as the way of righteousness. And that is the inevitability of trying to get close to God by doing the right things. I think a lot of our culture probably believes that. You know, if you're Islamic, you'll give alms to the poor. Not because you have empathy with the poor, but because you might do it for that reason but because you think that God in heaven is going to sort of balance your bad deeds against your good deeds. And oh, he's given, he's given alms to the poor. He's cared. He's given some money to the poor. He's, he's read out the Quran out loud. He's done this or that. It's nonsense to our Father in heaven. Jesus has done all the work. He's paid for all our sin. And by faith, we can enter into the kingdom of God repentance and faith and you see that, that, that you, can, you grasp it don't you if you've been brought up with the law of Moses and going to the temple if you've been brought up and, and it, is, it is beauteous to read the law if you've never read you know, Leviticus and Deuteronomy it's beauteous the, the stories and everything of course we, we now view that through Jesus' eyes in the New Testament so we understand it. It's the pedagogos. It's, it's given temporarily, is, is what uh, Paul goes on to say. The law is temporary. So it doesn't apply anymore. Because the law will condemn you. The law will always condemn. Um, and sometimes when the law, the, the law operates that way, you know, I think that is probably how our culture feels when we say to them, these are our Christian ethics. You're condemning me. No, this is truth. And I think our culture probably needs to hear it to understand that God is holy. The law is really um, a manifestation, if you can, of written down laws of, as to the holiness of God. But it is utterly unattainable by any of us without Christ. In Christ... We can fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. Um, faith working itself out through love. But without Christ, we can't. And that was the problem. This is the problem um, in Galatia, really. The law of Moses insists on circumcision. And so these Judaizers are coming in to the Christians who are free. They're free of the law of Moses. They're, they're unshackled from it. Now, I know that's shocking to people today that the Ten Commandments were only temporary. I've just said we built our civilization on these things, and they work. They can build a reasonable but not perfect civilization. But it isn't the reason that Jesus came. It isn't the reason he gave the Ten Commandments either. The Ten Commandments were given temporarily to a particular nation that one day God in his wisdom knew his son would be born into. And he had to protect that civilization with laws from all the foreign um, nations, if you like, that, that it would be ready to receive his son. That's why they were given. But they only ever condemn. Read through the Ten Commandments, see how you're doing. You know, you were, you're not doing very well, that's the truth. Paul says this in Romans chapter 1. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. <laughs> Just as, it, as it's written, the righteous will live by faith. So it is in there, of course. We know with Abraham, he... He is a believer, and it was credited to him as righteousness, his faith. When God spoke to Abraham, he believed. It was credited to him as righteousness. The trouble is with the law that when you try and obey it, 
you don't live by faith. You live by the law. You live by trying to be obedient to the law. That's what the Pharisees did. In fact, that's what everyone, according to Paul in Romans, does. Now, did the Old Testament Jews think that they, were, they could only be saved by grace? It's, it's very difficult to know. But certainly the Pharisees of Jesus' day, I don't think they did. Because when you observe the law, you don't want to be near sinners. They're sinners, they're dirty, keep them away from me. When you live by faith, you understand I'm a dirty sinner. But by the grace of God, I'm the same as you. I'm wretched, but I've been saved by faith. When Luther rediscovered this, and he had some issues with lots of things, really. He, he probably died a, a bitter man, but on this issue, he was right. He stood up to the Catholic magisterium and said, you're wrong. The Pope, you're wrong. You're all wrong. Just like Paul is saying here, and we'll see next week with Peter, Paul stood up and said no. He said, no, this is not the gospel anymore. You're enslaving people again with this thing. Now, I grew up a Catholic, and so I kind of liked it, really. On Tuesdays at school, I'd often go to Mass. There was a, a sense of fellowship. Of course, I didn't understand the presence, but there was something of God in, in everything. But I also knew at 19, this was my question. It's not anymore, but at 19, why did no one ever tell me that all I had to do was to ask Jesus into my life? Why did no one tell me that? It's so simple. I've learned all these things, and I've done all these things, and I've enjoyed something. Why did no one ever just say to me, Chris, this is what you've got to do? And it wasn't like I didn't know, I suppose, but it wasn't pushed down. The simplicity of the gospel, you see. And that's what Paul wants the disciples to get back to, because they're not under the law, they're under the Spirit. Because the, the law, if you will, the, the spirit of Christ has set, sets you free from the law of sin and death. So when you try and obey the law, strangely, don't covet, don't lie, don't steal. You'll actually lie and steal more. Because human beings do the opposite of what you're told to do. And Paul said it awakened sin in him. Before, he didn't know that you're not meant to do these things. Now he knows you're not meant to do it. Now he recognizes that he is doing it. He feels sinful all the time. Law of sin and death. But the Spirit sets you free from the law of sin and death. And the Spirit is a continual infusion of his presence, filling us again and again. You're not guilty. Walk in the Spirit. You won't gratify the desires of the sinful flesh. This is Christianity. Not that easy to walk in all the time. I think I've said once, I, I had a, a vision of Jesus when I was much younger. And when I saw Jesus looking at me with his eyes of pure love going straight through me, that's as close as I've ever been to understanding what it means to walk in the Spirit. To know that, and I remember this, there is nothing I could do that would separate me from his love. There's no sin that would separate me from his love. But we think there is. We think I've sinned. I've done this, the condemnation. But Paul says there's no condemnation now for those in Christ Jesus. The enemy comes to condemn you. The spirit comes to set you free. The enemy comes. Your flesh comes. The spirit comes to set you free. That's the gospel. John Wimber used to say this way, the way, the, way, the, way on, the way in is the way on. In other words, the way you came to Christ, you weren't probably looking for him. You were filled with the Spirit. You go back to those early moments, those early days and weeks and months of knowing Christ. The way in is the way on. That's the gospel. We're the freest people on the earth. No sin will ever be counted against you and me. This is what Paul is so strong. This is what he's, he's um, so adamant about. And says so these false believers are coming in. 
Now, because the church has been separated from Israel for 2,000 years, in AD 90, the, the Romans um, crucified thousands of Jews. They were, they were kicked out until 1948. And so for the first time in history, 2,000 years, Christianity and Judaism are moving close together again. It's one of the reasons I always support Israel. I will always support the Jews. Because one day, Jesus Christ himself will come down from heaven back to Jerusalem the way he left. That's what we're told in Acts chapter 1. God, who, who sits at the right hand of the Father, is coming back the same way he came. What a great day that will be. So it's, it's hardly any wonder that the enemy is going crazy at the Jews. All this anti-Semitism, do not join being anti-Semitic. It doesn't mean every Jewish person is the Messiah or anything. No, Paul says actually on behalf of the gospel, they're your enemy. But pray for them. They're reading the same Old Testament as you're reading. And one day when Jesus comes back, there will be this remnant that will find him and know him. And the, 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 the parting of the ways, if you like, we're now seeing these two things converge because we're entering, of course we're in the last days, but we can see, you know, we're entering to a point before Jesus comes. All the I forget who sets the nuclear clock one minute to midnight. You know, in 1990, it was like 15 minutes to midnight, 20 minutes to midnight. We're at one minute to midnight. God is faithful to his covenants. I believe that. God is faithful to his old people. We'll see these things happen again. So that's just a slight aside. Now, it says, as for those who are held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. In other words, Paul's gone in response to Revelation. He wants to make sure he's not running the race in vain. He's spoken to the apostles. The apostles agree with Paul. The gospel you're preaching is the right one. This is a gospel that sets people free when they hear it. Come to Christ. Years ago, you know, I was speaking at a nightclub, everyone's smoking, and, you know, people came to Christ every which way, totally, powerfully converted. And one girl came up to me and she said, can I ask you about what you've been saying? I said, of course. She said, well, it can't be right what you're saying. I said, what did I say? She said that God isn't looking for um, ethically, for, for good ethical people. She said, God must be looking for good ethical people. I said, in that case, no one's going to get in then. He came for all of us, and we're all sinners. We're all wretched. We're all desperately in need of the Savior's hope. And uh, it, it, it just amazed me that the gospel, when you preach it, is confrontational to those, particularly those who think they're pretty good. Those who are living a good life. No one lives a good life. You know, I'm, at my age, I know how wretched I am now. At 19, I thought I was pretty good. I, again, you know, being this little Catholic boy, I remember on one occasion, uh, a young girl was pregnant. I was horrified, you know. <laughs> I was like stoner. No, I wasn't that bad. But I, I remember being in a class at primary school, and I'd look at the class, and I would judge who was, like, the best qualified for God. You know, I'd put them all, they'd line them all up, and I'd think, well, you know, I'm right up here. I'm, I'm you know, God, I'm pretty good, really. I'm right up here with Jesus, you know. That's what I used to think. What a Pharisee, really. But that's what you do when you try and observe the law, you see. I found it out as a kid. When you're trying to do the righteous thing, instead of saying, actually, I, I'm pretty wicked and unrighteous, but hey, I can walk in the Spirit, I'm forgiven. And in doing that, I will fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. I will be kind. I will love God. I will love my neighbor. Because the Spirit will empower me and change me and convict me that to do the very things that Christ has asked me to do, the gospel. This is what... Paul is. And he says that uh, for God who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised was um, 
at work in Mears and are possible to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. They recognized the grace given to me. They agreed we should go to the Gentiles, and they continue to the circumcised. Of course, Peter preached at Cornelius' house, so it's not a black and white thing, this. It's just in the main what they're doing here. All they asked, we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I'd been eager to do all along. Now again, this, this, is, this is Paul. Now he's speaking to them to say, look, I'm accredited by the apostles who are with Jesus. I've had a revelation of the gospel which I've given to you. Therefore, I'm correcting you. And we'll read in the next few chapters just how Paul is willing to nail it down with them and correct them. So for you and me as takeaways, walk in the spirit. Every time you feel condemned, just take that condemnation and, and give it to Jesus. Every time you're trying to, you think I, you're trying to live under the law, step away from it. Walk with the spirit. And you'll fulfill the righteous requirements that God wants. That you're forgiven, that you're a forgiven sinner. And here the caring for the poor. You see, when you love God, when you're changed, your heart's been changed. Love is the outpouring. You want to love. You want to love those who hate you. You want to love those who might even despise you. Just as Stephen did with the Apostle Paul. Lord, count not this sin against him, against them. And the Lord didn't. He saved them. So there's the gospel, there's the beginnings of um, Galatians, which is vital for us to understand today, really, isn't it? I don't think the world quite gets it. I think they look at Christians and think they're, they're Mr. and Mrs. Goody Two-Shoes, or that they're somehow, you know, very condemning on people who sin. It's like, no, we're the opposite. It's like I'm in the same boat as the world. We're all sinners, just I've been rescued. And we have this wonderful, wonderful message to give. And so that's the, that's the gospel that we live in. Let's stand then and let's, if we have the band back and we'll, let's pray. And...